everybody back. Here comes my microphone up and we're getting close to starting. Oh, are we getting ready now? One minute. Oh, wow. Okay. All right. Well, again, uh, the summer is kind of winding down a little bit here, right? And so there's a little sadness in that because I love summer in Michigan. It's really beautiful and I'm going to miss it here. But actually, it's a gorgeous, beautiful day tonight. Uh huh. What's that? Yeah. Better days are coming. Okay, I think we're pretty close here, right? You ready to go? Wow. What a joy it is to greet all of you in the Lord. And uh, I feel like I uh, have, I can't say forgotten anybody, but, you know, two months have gone by and, you know, all of a sudden here we are again. But I'd like to extend a warm welcome to anybody that uh, maybe is here for the first time tonight. We're thrilled you're here. And uh, we've got an exciting evening for you. And again, for those of you on the live stream, uh, I think the wonderful thing is, is getting emails from all over the United States of people that are watching this broadcast. And so uh, if you're out there in live stream land, we hope that uh, you will have a wonderful evening with us as well. And again, uh, the handouts will be underneath. Uh, they will be posted later tonight, and there'll be five of them. So we're going to have a great evening, and uh, again, um, so many exciting things are happening, I, I, I don't even begin to know where to start. So I'm just going to get started tonight uh, with some stuff that's underway, and we'll be back into the book of Revelation in chapter 6, and we're going to find the United States in Revelation chapter 6. Now, some of this is going to be a little heavier tonight, but hang on, you know, because it'll all come together. But we're at a very important turning point in world history right now. I'll try to explain all of these things. Also, a couple of brief announcements before we have a prayer. Um, many of you know there's a ministry called Understanding the Times with Jan Markell, and she has a, a conference that she's sponsoring called Behold, He Comes. And so, um, Behold, He Comes. And so Jan has some special speakers, and that conference is going to be this Saturday. And some of you know uh, Pastor Jack Hibbs from Calvary Chapel in Chino Hills, California. The conference will be starting at 9 o'clock in the morning this Saturday. Interesting. What's an interesting thing about when the conference is? You know, it's on 9-11, so that's kind of an interesting date. But anyway, so it's going to be Saturday uh, there at 9 a.m. at Calvary Chapel. And so you can go on and, and log on there if you find Calvary Chapel. Calvary Chapel in Chino Hills. And I'm sure you can find it. And I believe that, you know, it's $5 if anybody would like to do that. So if you would like to do that, then you can just go on and, and, and do that. Or... Better yet, we're going to be hosting it here, and so we will have a live stream here at Oak Hill Church. But because of the uh, Pacific time, this is Pacific time over here, um, that would be noon here. So we're going to have it starting at Oak Hill at noon, and so you're welcome to come, and it doesn't even cost you $5, so it's just a, it's a freebie, so you're welcome to come and join us. But you know, these are good people, and I think they have some wonderful things to share. So if that's something that's on your mind, you might want to think about doing that. And so that's that issue. Um, also, again, the five handouts tonight. And by the way, tonight is the first day after the rapture, right? The first day after the Feast of Trumpets. Uh, so we'll get into that. Now, I have had, I know this is shocking to you, I have some discouraged saints that are feeling like, we didn't have the rapture, the Lord didn't return, and even a few, and I know this is shocking, mildly disappointed in me somehow that I, that I, I don't know, that I either disappointed people or whatever, but uh, we'll get into that. Yeah, we'll get into that, yeah. No, we did not miss the rapture, so that's good. Uh, we have people in this church, actually, Brad, we have people in this church that want to start a support group. So if the Lord doesn't come... 
in a, in a particular year, we're all going to gather in a little group here and we're going to say, hi, my name's Jeff and the rapture didn't happen this year. So you may want to join that group. I don't know if that's something you want to do. And, um, but we're really going to get into it tonight and, and all that is underway uh, as we will get in through the evening is about um, the decline and fall of our country. So it's heavy duty a little bit, but uh, it's joyful because we know where we're heading. And I would just say, honestly, even though the rapture didn't happen right, you know, this year, uh, we're right on schedule. And those of you who were looking for that email uh, in the summer, if, if, that, if that email had come out, this would have been the year. But you didn't get the email from me, and I think as we look into it tonight, you'll know why it didn't happen this year. But when that year comes, I think you'll know. Anyway, let's have a uh, word of prayer, and then uh, I have a pastoral song tonight with Glenn, because I know that some of you may be heartbroken, the Lord didn't come this year on the Feast of Trumpets, so we're going to have what a friend we have in Jesus. We're going to more of a pastoral theme for the binding of the broken hearts here, if anybody is just kind of feeling now, you know, and everything. And by the interesting thing, and we'll get into this as, we, as, a, as evening unfolds, my daughter, as we were getting ready to come over, she said, Dad, you can't believe what Biden is doing with all these announcements about COVID and the vaccines and everything. But that's right on schedule. You see, just after the rapture, a lot of stuff's going to happen fast. So we're actually right on uh, schedule, and we'll get into that tonight. Let's have a word of prayer. We'll get started tonight. Father, we do thank you tonight, Lord, that your timing is perfect. Lord, you know everything about our lives. You know our rising and setting. You know everything about our life, Lord. You know our future, and you know, Lord, when we're going to be looking at you face to face. So, Lord, we're thankful that you know all these things. We're still down here, as the Apostle Paul said, a little bit looking through a glass darkly. We see your purpose is coming. We know they're getting closer. But, Lord, even we here, even though scriptures are amazing, Lord, we don't have all the answers just yet. And so I just pray, Lord, as we look at some things tonight, that you'll help us to see that your hand is, is on the world, that you have not forgotten us, that you've not forgotten Israel, your covenant people, and that, Lord, you have an amazing future for all of us. So we give the evening to you and just thank you for letting us be here. I pray for everyone out there in, in live stream land that people can share this all over the country with people. It's an important time to share the hope that only our Lord gives us, a hope of forgiveness, a hope of resurrection, and a beautiful future in the world to come. So, Lord, thank you for the evening, and we pray all these things in our Lord Jesus' name. Amen. And now, as many of you know, our world-famous music director, Mr. Glenn Boldheist, and we're actually doing something fairly pastoral tonight, right, Glenn? Fairly pastoral. Fairly right. pastoral. As, as Jeff has mentioned, it's what a friend we have in Jesus, and it's number 630 in the red book. So I ask you to open to 630 and uh, rise together, and we'll sing three stanzas.
be seated. And I always like to sing next to Glenn because I sound better. So <laughs> Glenn has saved me many of a bad note. But uh, anyway, again, welcome to everybody here. And we're going to turn on our CDs here. And again, as many of you know, we have the live stream, but we also have CDs. So if you want to just take this in your car, you can certainly do that. And wherever you might be going, if that's something of interest to you. We run about 80 minutes, you know, unless we get on some rabbit trails, we can't leave. But um, I'm just going to get started tonight. Obviously, we're doing a little bit of catch up from the summer, but, uh, you know, clearly there's a lot underway. And um, as we're going to see tonight, and of course, as we get ready for what's about to happen, all this is going to happen very fast. It's going to happen very fast. Afghanistan fell in one day. 9-11 happened in one day. These are events that are related. What just happened in Afghanistan is related to 9-11. Now, a lot of us are thinking, wow, really? Yeah, really. Because in the end, we're watching the Lord's eternal purposes coming to pass. And so remember, as we study in our class, you can't understand the future without understanding the past. And as all of you know, as students in this class, what's the primary way the Lord has always taught us is to look at Israel. Look at that nation, watch her, follow her, study what her journey is, and that will be the best way to really understand what's going on. And so, of course, we'll be doing that tonight again. Um, what I thought we would start off with here tonight is talk to you a little bit about why this wasn't the year. You know, uh, every year could potentially be the year because we're so close now, but the bottom line is there are always a couple things that may have to happen and we don't exactly know. How many of us who studied prophecy or as Christians heard of anything three years ago about COVID? I mean, some of the things that the Lord does are just things we're not going to be able to totally discern. I told my wife when we went to Europe uh, on the Reformation tour in 2019, I told my wife this, babe, we got to go this year. We've got to go in 2019 if we're going to do this trip to Europe. Something big is coming in 2020. Well, Pastor Jeff was right on that because I knew it was on its way. I didn't know how it was going to unfold, but when 2020 happened, there was no Easter services, first fruits anywhere in the United States, and everybody was locked down like we're on a Passover holiday. I knew that we were moving rapidly into what I knew was on its way. And you notice one thing, that since these things have happened, you notice it's not slowing down? Have you ever wondered why we're not in any kind of slow thing? It's not like all of a sudden we're going to go back to Kansas and have five years and kind of just have a lot of picnics. No, this thing is going to continue at a fairly regular steady pace right into the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ because we're in the early stages of the birth pangs. And you remember what our Lord said, once a uh, woman goes into labor, it doesn't turn around. Now, I, you know, having three daughters and watching my children go through it, when a woman is going into labor, there are little seasons when it's slower, and then the birth pangs will come on. But they never stop, and it never gets easier. And I think that's a pretty good way to look at, at uh, prophecy. They have some contractions, if, ladies, you know this. Braxton Hick contraction are some of the earliest stages contractions that a lady will have before a baby is born and then it might slow and maybe not much will happen but once the Braxton Hicks uh, contractions no you know you're heading to full labor right it's not like oh well we're going to go back and well, let's just take a vacation so I think that's where we need to see that we're in right now is that what is on its way will continue at a fairly steady pace until the Lord comes so it's going to be boring, I promise you, what's underway here in the next year. It's going to be exciting. It's going to be a little challenging for some of us. But remember that the, the, the primary picture of essentially what is have to happen is we're looking for the counterfeit of our Lord. Remember, everybody, that all of the Bible is giving two plans, the Lord's wonderful plan and the world's plan. The Lord has a wonderful Redeemer, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the world has its Redeemer, it's counterfeit, the, the Antichrist. And so the Bible is always connected between those two individuals, Christ and Antichrist. It started right in the garden. Remember Genesis chapter 3, verse 15? I will put enmity between you and the woman, between her seed and your seed. You know, And he will bruise your head and you will bruise his heel. That is the announcement, of course, of this battle between the two kingdoms right in Genesis chapter 3. And of course, you know, we're in that right now. 
And unfortunately, the world right now, and many people here in Grand Rapids, Michigan, are not looking for the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, uh, one of the things that happened with COVID is we got a really counterfeit word. Let me write that word here. And the word that we got uh, from our culture and from many of our political world, world is we got this word. This is the first time that political leaders started to use this word. And it's not an unimportant word that people are using. The word that the politicians were using and many people in government is what were they going to do? They were going to keep everybody safe. That was the word that was picked up by people. And people would greet each other and they'd walk away from one another and say, hmm, stay safe. Now that was the way of saying, don't get COVID, you know, put your mask on, whatever you need to do, just stay safe. But remember, that's the counterfeit. Because only the Lord can keep us safe, right? We can't, nobody can keep anybody safe, no governor or president. But remember, that's the counterfeit, and that word is really essentially the word that comes from this kingdom, and it is a kingdom. And of course, remember that this kingdom is ultimately, essentially, uh, a, a slavery. And as we've talked throughout the class and over the years, remember that the Antichrist, as we've often talked about, you know, who is the Antichrist? He's just the last pharaoh. He's just the last pharaoh. And what's the book of Revelation? The book of Revelation is the last Passover story, right? That's what the book of Revelation is. It's a Passover story. And isn't it amazing that when COVID hit, the world created a Passover story. They had everybody go behind the door, close the door, and wait till death passed by. Few people saw that the world, in many ways, was counterfeiting the miracle of Passover in which, through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, we go behind a door and we are not safe, we're saved. And so the counterfeit of this word safe is this word salvation. That's the imperative word. You know, the, the culture cannot save us. And really, if we're honest, the culture can't keep us even safe. That's just an illusion and, you know, as I've loved to share with people over the years, because I think it's terrible if the Christian church is more interested in safety than salvation. We have a lot of people, even pastors in this city, they want to keep their churches locked down and everything's socially distanced and everybody's doing everything great. Some of that may have a place, but I don't think the church should be over here thinking about safety. We should be thinking about our Savior. That's where the church I believe, needs to put its energy and its focus. Because this is a counterfeit. And one of the things you learn is whoever you trust to keep you secure, that's your God. Whoever you trust to keep you secure eventually becomes, of course, your Lord. Let's take a quick look at a passage tonight as we get into this. So much going on. Uh, turn with me to John chapter 5. And I've always felt this is one of the great passages that's not talked about enough. We've looked at it here in this class over the years. John 5 is a great passage where our Lord is telling us um, what the world does. The world's running around all the time looking for praise and adoration. Aren't you wonderful? And aren't you a great president or senator or congressman or leader or whatever? But the problem is, is that as we go to people for applause, and aren't you great? Aren't you wonderful? We don't go to the Lord for his blessings. We go to people and we end up giving things to politicians and leaders that only can belong to our Lord. And any time the culture begins to start looking to itself, you know that the issue there has nothing to do with the Lord because in the end they've got to go to him. He's the only one. John chapter 5 and a very important section of past, uh, things here. Notice about our Lord. Unlike our political leaders and many people in government and all over, you know, um, he says uh, in verse 41, he says, I do not accept the praise from men, but I know you. Now who's he talking to? The leaders. He's talking to the leaders of Israel. He's talking to the religious establishment. He's talking to the leaders of Israel. He says, but I know you. I know that you do not have the love of God in your hearts. I've come in my Father's name and you do not accept me. But if someone else comes in his own name, him you will accept. Now, there's the Antichrist. The whole thing always comes down to someone's going to come in his own name to keep you safe, to help you, to get you whatever you need or whatever. There's always going to be somebody coming in his own name. 
And our Lord said that this is the group that's the buddy club over here, but they make no attempt to go to the Lord and ask for his blessing and for the things that only he can give. And so what we're watching right now, of course, increasingly, is that the world is getting ready to receive someone else. And of course, you have to realize, you know, as we, and I'm going to be preaching on this Sunday, uh, those of you in the Oak Hill family, I'm preaching a, a message entitled The 6% Church. And the 6% church is only 6% of the Christian church has a biblical worldview. So that is telling us we're in some trouble. But remember that as we've been watching the church get into trouble, notice as the Christian faith has gotten kind of weak, notice what's happening is our Lord is kind of going down a little bit in a cultural way in the church. But we notice that another group seems to be getting stronger. And, of course, it's led by a group that is run, we refer to them as the media, but the media is just the mediator because the media is ultimately a stand-in for the Lord Jesus Christ, and the media is mediating reality and truth to people to get people ready for the Antichrist. So as the church has gotten weaker and weaker and weaker, and we're kind of sitting in the corner and nobody really pays much attention to the church anymore, it takes the church all that seriously. And why do you think that sometimes that people don't take the church seriously? Because we just want to be safe. We just want to get along with everybody. But the problem is that's a weak church. When the church is like that, people aren't taking us seriously, saints. Now, that's not true in every case. There's some great churches, you know, people like Jack Hibbs. There's great pastors in America. But a lot of our churches in good old Grand Rapids, Michigan, are over here living in this world. People don't take that group seriously. It's a joke. And this is the reason that the church now has become just like the Lions Club or something. It's not a, it's not a group that really inspires a lot of uh, concern. You know, if you think if the church was strong and really powerful in our country, even in our city, do you think people would be doing what they've been doing to the churches? Do you think they'd be locking these places down and fining them and doing the things that we've seen? Do you think any politician in America would have the nerve to tell the church in America or in Michigan that they were non-essential? Nobody talks like that about the church of the living God unless there's a real secularism. So anyways, the church has gotten weak. We know that our Lord, at least in public expression, has been going down. We know as the media and the mediator is coming up, we know that, that this team has taken the field. And all of a sudden, we had the defining election in the history of this country, right? Biden has come in. And I'm not going to go into all of that, but we will get into some of that a little bit here tonight. One of the things that I was saying to my wife when we were coming over here, we're really wrestling with how much we can share right now. Uh, we don't want to be taken down, but we are open to looking at other platforms. So I think we're going to do the best we can. And occasionally, I'm not going to say things as bluntly as I'd like to. And that's partly for the censorship issues. So I'm going to be a little warmer and fuzzier on some things, but I know that you're all so smart. You will understand what I'm saying, right? So we're going to go ahead and go down that road. But maybe, you know, three months, four months, six months, uh, we're taken down. You just have to be ready for whatever's coming our way, right? Okay, now, if you take a look at, at what the world always does, is the world always tries to replace our Lord by solving a problem. As Rahm Emanuel, former chief of staff of President Obama, never waste a good crisis. And we just happen to have a very good crisis that's underway right now, and they are not wasting it. And if you can see today in some of the things that were mentioned by the Biden administration of new guidelines or requirements and stuff, you realize that the crisis is hardly uh, going away, right? Now, the real crisis that's going on in the world is another crisis. It's called sin. That's a really big crisis. Walking away from the Lord, the wonderful Lord, and going off with this team? I mean, that's, that's the crisis. I mean, the crisis is not covid the crisis is walking away from our Lord and forgetting about something called sin because that's the only crisis the Lord is interested in solving. COVID and all these other things are just one of many things that can happen in any time, anywhere. But the real issue, the Lord's always been concerned. He's always interested in, in, in redeeming us and loving us and solving that primary issue. That's the issue that everybody should be thinking about tonight. Now, as you get into where we're moving here tonight, remember that the reason that this is not the year is because we didn't have a crisis to bring the Antichrist in. 
Okay? We've got some baby crises, but we have to have the big crisis. And remember that the heart of the crisis that has to come for the Antichrist is Israel has to be in a major Middle East war before that crisis will bring the nations and the Antichrist in to fulfill the prophecies of the Bible. The things that are going on in Afghanistan is more about us in the United States. Eventually, it will bleed in after the rapture to deal with Israel, but not now. Right now, what you have watched go on in Afghanistan is about the U.S. of A. And we'll get into it, a little heavy-duty stuff, but that's the kind of thing. So remember that the goal and focus of the Antichrist is he's going to want to go ahead and be a savior to Israel. But right now, Israel doesn't need saving yet. So right now, as we're watching the chaos, and remember, who has always been Israel's savior in a human and political way? Israel's savior politically has always been the United States. Now, all of us must understand that as this chaos is unfolding in our country, what's happening to Israel's human savior in a way? Well, our, her savior is going away. The Biden administration has turned against Israel, is making uh, plans and negotiating with her, her chief enemy, Iran. Uh, and so as all of this is unhappening, we're beginning to realize, well, wait a minute, if, 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 if uh, Israel doesn't have the, the, the United States, oh, well, then who's going to take care of her? Well, of course, in the short term, it's the Antichrist. But, of course, we realize that that isn't going to work, and so we realize that in the end, everything that's going on right now tonight, including the decline of this country, is to set this scenario up where Israel is not going to be protected by us. She's going to look for a new protector that's going to be, essentially, you might say, this is her Judas. So that's on its way. But remember, we've got to see that Middle East war. We've got to see that Middle East war. And we've talked a lot tonight about this over the years. It's patterned after the Six-Day War in 1967. I'm not going to go into all of that tonight. It's patterned after the Six-Day War. Why do we see that as the pattern? Is because it's a picture of what the Lord was doing. Remember, they fought for six days, and on the seventh day, they rested. You see, it was a false millennium. It was a false Sabbath that happened in 1967. And that war in 67 is a picture of what's coming up. And we'll get into all of that. But what we need to see is something like this, something crazy, it's going to be big, and then it'll all be set up, and just before that happens, we'll be with the Lord. So that's where we are. Now, I would have sent you an email this summer if this happened. If I saw this happen, you'd get the email. We'd have our class. And I'd say, hey, this is the year. This is the year. Now, I wanted to start out tonight talking about 9-11 because how many of you believe, or I, I think we have to believe, that 9-11, which is coming up Saturday, was a defining moment in world history or certainly in this country? I think most of us would go, hey, I don't know what that was about, but that was something big. Yeah, it was big, and it's related to what's going on right now in Afghanistan. Isn't it fascinating in a sad way that remember that the reason we went to Afghanistan in 2020, uh, 2001, right after 9-11, why did people go over there? To stop what happened at 9-11. And now, 20 years later, the area, right, that was the launching area for Al-Qaeda and all these groups that eventually came against the country in the 9-11 thing, People are saying, without any question now, we're in a more serious national security time than we were in 2001. Now, does everybody realize this is not going away? See, Biden has this idea. Let's just get everybody out, and we'll go out and get everybody vaccinated. And as soon as we do that, the world will be safe. Oh, the world will be safe. We don't have to worry. You know, this stuff over here, this... Israel, no. We're just going to get everybody safe and we're going to get all of our troops out and everything's going to be kumbaya. See, this is, this is essentially nothing more than Neville Chamberlain in 1938, appeasing evil and totally turning a blind eye to what's about to happen. So that's where we need to see this as the Lord's people tonight because we're in this and unfortunately it's not all happy land. So what I want to do tonight is take out the first sheet that I wanted to give you here um, where is that sheet? 
Take out the white sheet that says September 2001. Do you have that sheet? And those of you that are studying with us tonight, you know, again, we, we build a lot of our study of the Bible around knowing God's calendar, knowing some basic seasons. And as many of you know, tonight, tonight, by the way, tonight is a Jewish holiday. And tonight is interesting, isn't it? They have a Jewish holiday on Tishrei 3. It's called the Fast of Gedaliah. And notice, what does it follow? It follows Tishrei 1 and 2, which was the last two days here, right? And we know that the two days, last two days, Tishrei 1 and 2 is the Feast of Trumpets, as it's called in Leviticus 23. The Feast of Trumpets, and the Jewish people often refer to it not as the Feast of Trumpets, but as Rosh Hashanah, which just means the head of the year. So the last two days were Rosh Hashanah, the beginning of the year. So this is really the Jewish New Year was the last couple of days. But right after the Feast of Trumpets, they're fasting. Why? Why is everybody fasting? Because they missed the rapture. The fast of Gedaliah commemorates that the person in Jerusalem, Gedaliah, the governor, was murdered by treacherous people who made up a series of lies and used those lies to take control and gain power. What do you think just happened today with the Biden administration's announcements? See? So we're actually on these calendars right now, and that's why I said if you can just follow some of this, you don't have to learn it all. I mean, I, obviously I've been doing this for 35 years, but just, just have a general sense and remember basic things like Christ came in the first time in the spring, he died on Passover, rose on first fruits, he's coming back in the fall. So we are in the season when the Lord Jesus Christ is going to come. He's not going to come in the spring. The Lord will return for us as his people and to deliver Israel in the fall. And that's, of course, when our Lord began his public ministry. Now, if you take uh, this sheet out, notice what I did. I circled September 11th for you, right? This is the Jewish calendar in the year 2001. So if you just follow with me here, I don't want to lose anybody. And again, saints, if you don't follow this or this doesn't get you excited, don't worry about it. We just hope to get the big picture here. You notice I circled September 11th, and notice that when the actual 9-11 happened, right, 20 years ago, see there it says that's the 23rd day of the month of Elul, okay? And it was the Jewish year 5761. Does everybody see that? Everybody's following with me right there? And notice what I said is you're, that's, when, that's when this war is coming up. It's going to be right around the time of 9-11 or before. The war that we're looking for in the Middle East is coming up in late summer, most likely, like the Six-day war, remember that was in June. This war will come up in the summer or even the early fall, setting up all that's going to happen after that. Because you notice that after all of this chaos goes on with this battle and, and all this craziness, what happens a week after September 11th? The rapture, there it is. One week after there, you notice September 18th in the year 2001, Rosh Hashanah, 5762, first day of Tishrei. And notice where in 2001 we are tonight. We are here on the 20th. Now, in 2001, if you look at your sheet, notice the Fast of Gedaliah. Do you see that right there on your sheet? Fast of Gedaliah in that year was on the 20th. It's tonight. Now, how many people know when you're fasting, you're sad? Why have the Jewish people been fasting and remembering this murder and this treachery that took place here during this time is because God wanted them to know that will appear again. There will be betrayal coming against your nation and you will weep and mourn, but you're not even aware of what's happened. So what we're actually seeing here is that you notice what I put there on the thing in 2000. Um, 
2001, I just wrote, Antichrist's plan unfolds. We're with the Lord here, you see. If the Lord had come in 2001, we would have been with the Lord on the 18th. But what happens after we're gone? Well, then the treachery comes. The murder, the deception, the chaos comes. And that's exactly as it has been and as it's going to be. And then you notice down on the 27th, of course, I wrote down on the calendar for you false peace. Now remember, church, there's only two kinds of pieces. A peace. There's a true peace that our Lord gives us. I've come to give you peace, not as the world gives you. I've come to give you the peace, of course, that our Father gives us through him and his atoning death. But remember that just as we've talked about, we've got over here, right? Salvation is true peace. But we know, of course, that over here is a false peace. And so those are the patterns that we're seeing coming up right now. And, of course, what's the Antichrist do? If you look at the 27th in the year September um, 2001, that's the day when the Antichrist will bring security, safety, and peace to the world. Isn't it interesting when the Apostle Paul talks about what the Antichrist is going to do, what does Paul say? He says when people are saying peace and safety or security, it's interesting that our Lord doesn't use the word security the same way that the world does. I mean, we're secure in him, but that's because we have the true peace. So you can see that the world has got a system here that they're using to counterfeit our Lord in every way. So in a way, what happened in September 11th is going to happen one more time. And in the year it's going to happen, when this pattern repeats itself, we'll be with the Lord. So just remember that that's the pattern you've got to watch for. So if you're out having volleyball and fun and drinking milkshakes in next summer, I don't think that'll happen, but just assume that that does, uh, we're not ready. And that's why as this thing got closer, what actually happened was this thing on Afghanistan was about us falling away and setting this up. That's why what happened with Afghanistan just happened. It's not directly about what's going to happen to Israel now. It's about how Israel is being set up for what's coming. But what's the great setup for Israel? The great setup for Israel is we are out of the picture. How many of you really think, and you, you know, I was thinking it's so fascinating, you know, and, and there's a sadness, you know, because my We've had relatives, both of our mothers, my wife's mom and my mom have had dementia. We understand what this is. This is serious stuff. You don't put people in world leadership with some of these issues. Now, you contrast and compare what's underway now in terms of how Israel must see things and just roll back one year and remember the, the incredible relationship between Netanyahu and Trump. You don't want to mess with those two guys. They're both gone. And in the place where there's gone is this appeasement, this working along in a way and is ignoring these things because the things that we are watching right now would not have happened if Trump was in office. They might have happened differently, but they certainly wouldn't happen the way they have. It's not that there wouldn't be issues. But how many of us really think it would have ended this way with Trump in office? The bottom line is we're watching things that nobody could ever have predicted in this country. Nobody, there are a lot of veterans and a lot of people, but as a student of the Bible, what I see here is a display of tremendous weakness that's going on that's going to invite other things to happen to create that Middle East war. Because what am I saying? Israel's protector is falling back. The war is coming. How does that happen? Somebody has to bring out weakness so that Israel is more vulnerable. We begin to see where we're heading here because remember that all of this ultimately is about Israel. And remember that as you take a look at Israel's number one enemy in the last several years, right? It's been Iran. And notice that Iran and Afghanistan have now just out of nowhere come out of literally nowhere and they're part of the Persian Empire. Now we're going to get in and look at the Persian Empire, but what we're actually watching right now, literally in the mass, last few couple months, it seems like, we're watching the reforming of the ancient kingdom that destroyed Babylon. So we're going to see that all of this is not some sort of coincidence. You know, it's all part of things that the Lord has done. So let me, 
let me see if I erase this over here. You know, I wanted to talk for a minute about my stamp collection, and I finished up uh, my, my class last June, as I think it was June 10th, and I was ending up, you know, doing my stamp collection. So, as many of you know, I know this isn't probably that fascinating, but I collect Israeli stamps and coins, so I have my Israeli stamp collection. And, you know, I, I have a pretty good stamp collection and stuff, and I have fun with it, but here's the thing. Why do I do this? Because I just love stamps? No. I l you learn about people. You learn about countries. You learn about Israel. So I brought along one of my Israel stamp things. And, you know, if we had fun tonight, we should just do this. I could just take you through this stamp thing, and we have all the prophecies of the Bible right here. See, the interesting thing is, but the Israelis don't know that. You know, they don't know what their stamps are about because in the end, what they're doing, of course, is just remembering their history. But every time you remember history, you remember Samson, you remember any of these people in the Bible, you're ultimately going back into what's coming, the prophetic things that are on our way. The Israelis don't know. It's just a stamp. See? Now, before the break, I, or just before our break, I got into the life of this guy, and he is coming up here soon, very soon, I talked, uh, for those of you that were with us, about Bar Chokba. Now, again, if you came here tonight, you haven't heard that name, Bar Chokba. He just means the son of the star. He's a false messianic leader. He's a person that came into Israel, again, around 132 to 135. And this was essentially a Jewish war. Hundreds of thousands of Jewish people died in this war. And I talked about it back in June. But he was, of course, the false, a picture of the false messiah. And why was this such an important defining moment in Israel's history is because essentially what we know as the nation of Israel, in a way, kind of came to an end in 135. And in that great war, the Romans came in and just kind of trashed the place, and they ended up creating what we call this kind of diaspora where they got kicked out of the land, they got pushed out of Jerusalem and all of these things, and they made pagan temples on the Temple Mount and all these things. There are some electrifying things going on with the temple, and maybe we'll have a chance to get to that, certainly as this unfolds. We'll certainly be doing this in Revelation 11. So remember that in 1935, remember that Israel is renamed Palestine, Right In 135, as we've shared, Israel's named after her enemies as a punishment by the Romans for causing this war. And remember that it's still called Palestine, you know, the Palestinians, and we have that drama going on. But remember that this thing went all the way on until 1948. Right? And, of course, in 1948, what did the Israelis do? And I talked about this at the break. They ended up minting stamps. And the first series of stamps they minted was to honor Bar Kokhba. So we come back in, one, in 1948, so you get the stamp collection, and they honor the false messiah. It's unbelievable. I mean, these things, just, you can't even really believe this stuff. So they honor the false messiah, but they just saw him as a, a leader trying to create freedom. They didn't see that he actually was responsible for leading to the deaths of hundreds of thousands of people who believed he was going to save them. He was going to save them from their enemies. So anyway, I, have some, I wanted to show you this one stamp. It's uh, 1961, you know, and so you probably aren't really thinking about that right now. But anyway, here's one of my sections of the book. And in 1961, here's all these cool things about Israel. And you can come up and look at this if you'd like. But Israel in 1961 celebrates the new year here. And um, year 50, let's see, where am I here? 61. Yeah, there we go. Jewish New Year 5722. And they have these three stamps here to honor the great heroes of Israel. <laughs> now, you might guess who one of the great heroes of Israel is. But anyway, the first hero that they honor in their stamps is somebody you all know, Samson. So, you know, I would say that, that Samson was a hero. I mean, obviously, he had a lot of personal challenges and stuff, but, but he was a hero figure. I mean, he delivered Israel. He's one of the judges. Then you come into the second one, and the second stamp here is Judah the Maccabee. Now, if you know anything about uh, the Maccabean period, it's a picture of the tribulation period, which is about to happen, by the way. So you have Judah the Maccabee, 
and he's definitely a good guy, a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ, so is Samson, by the way. But isn't it fascinating that these were all called heroes of Israel? And so, unfortunately, the third one is Barakokba. So he's put in there, right in there with Samson. So we got Barakokba. And what they've done is they've taken two great figures from the history of Israel and they put them in with the Antichrist. They don't have any idea what's even happening, you see. So this is the problem we've got is that, you know, for us today, you know what would be similar for us as Christians? To have the most popular boy's name, Judas. You know, we're going to name all of our sons Judas to honor Judas Iscariot and all of the betrayals of our Lord. Well, we all realize that we get it about Judas. People are not calling their sons Judas. We don't like that guy. We understand that he was a betrayer, that he did some things that were not great. But that's the equivalent of what the Israelis are doing. Because essentially the Antichrist is Judas. He's a betrayer of the nation and her Lord. The problem is, again, you know, people just don't see this stuff. So, you know, because I know what the Lord is doing in these areas, I read this stamp album and I kind of get kind of sad about it because I know where this is going and I don't like it all, but it's on its way. We just have to accept that that's kind of where we are here. So anyway, let's um, get in now to some things that I think are very important here about this. Let me erase this here anyway. We're going to be doing more with Bar Kokhba down the road, but for now, I think we'll just kind of let that one go. All right. Now, let's take a look at some patterns of history that God has put here for us so that we can know exactly what's going on. And we're in it right now. It's big stuff underway. I want you to take with me, if you have the sheet here, uh, the green sheet. Do you have your green sheet? Now notice, all I'm giving you is essentially the month of September. I gave you the one for 2001 when 9-11 happened, and I also gave you tonight uh, in the green sheet September of 1938. Now, guess what? Same story. Nothing's changed. What's about to happen? Same story. Nothing has really changed. So let's take a look at where we are here. We're in the fast of Gedaliah tonight, and we know that Tishrei 3, right, Tishrei 3, tonight, we all know that based on our understanding of the Feast of Trumpets and Rosh Hashanah, that our Lord will come and fulfill that appointment in some future year. Notice that that day comes after the Feast of Trumpets that after the Feast of Trumpets comes this fast, right? With not a really happy time. I think we would all agree on that, right? And all of a sudden, the last major deception of the world took place right then. Exactly then. Because on the fourth and the fifth days, Adolf Hitler made peace with the world. So all of a sudden, on Tishrei 4 and 5 in, in 1938, Adolf Hitler walks into the stage, and the world is saying, wow, hey, yeah, let's have peace in our time. Talked about that many times. And if you take a look at the sheet, I wrote down on there, if you can find, um, let's see, my glasses back on here. If you look at the 26th and the 27th, those were essentially Rosh Hashanah, first of Tishrei, in the year 5699. Then, look at the 28th day, right? Third of Tishrei, which is tonight, right? The fast of Gedaliah. Notice, when did Hitler walk into the world and create the false peace? Well, he walked in the next day. And he's in Munich, and I've been in the building. When Diane and I went to... to Germany, we, I had to go there, so we went there. The place where Hitler made peace in 1938 is still standing. I was right there, you know, and, I, and I'm just, and, and I've talked about this before, and this was kind of the crazy part about this, is, you know, here's the building, you know, where Hitler made peace on uh, essentially Tishrei 4 and 5 in September of 1938, but, you know, here, here's the place where the, the false peace was signed, 
but I shared this a few weeks ago that just within probably, you know, maybe two, three hundred yards, the Germans had built something called the Documentation Center, documenting everything that Hitler did so that we wouldn't let it happen again. So you go to the Documentation Center, and the Germans were good because they said, and I think they're right, we got to remember what Hitler did because if we don't remember what happened, it could happen to us. And so over here, Diane and I spent several hours on the Documentation Center. And I just commented to my beautiful wife, I said, hey, babe, nobody remembered a thing. And as we were doing this, what was actually going on is we had just seen a couple years earlier before Trump came into office, do you remember that just as uh, Obama had left office, what was his singular goal? To make peace with the Nazis? Because remember that the Islamic world is essentially the spirit of the Nazis. And remember, as we've talked many times, that Iran is the Persian Empire, but Iran comes from Aryan. And of course, essentially, the Iranians are the Nazis. Now, you'd kind of get this, but nobody seems to get it. Because what have the Iranians said? We're going to finish what Hitler started. It's good we've all got him in the land of Israel now. One bomb and we can get them all. And people talk like this, and then our State Department and our president and other people say, you know what, we can work with these people. We can, we can create peace in our time. So, you know, when we were in the documentation center, we just came out of the Munich place where the thing was signed. I just felt a heaviness of my heart. I said, nobody remembers the thing, and they're doing the same thing again. And notice, <laughs> isn't it fascinating when this got started, that all of a sudden we have part two? And what are we watching? The same thing is going on again. You know, one of the things that Naftali Bennett did, who's the current Israeli prime minister, uh, I won't get into all that stuff with him tonight, but the bottom line with Bennett is he's coming, he came to Washington, and it was really embarrassing for me. Did you see this thing? It was unbelievable. It was like something out of the Twilight Zone. You know, I expected Rod Serling to come out. Any of you remember the Twilight Zone? But here's the Prime Minister of Israel sitting in the Oval, in, essentially in the White House, one of the most, maybe I say the most important person on earth because he's a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ, whether or not, you know, people understand that or not. But here he is, he's talking to President Biden, and he's, you know, blah, 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 and Biden's falling asleep. I don't know if any of you saw this, but anyway, you know, Bennett was sitting there thanking you, Mr. President, you know, and Biden is down like this. And I thought to myself, can, is this not a prophetic moment? And if you watch the thing, and I happened to catch it, when he was talking to Bennett, do you remember what he said to Bennett? He said, I want to thank President Obama for building that great relationship. And yet Obama was the one that betrayed it. And now, as we see this going on with Biden, Basically, Naftali Bennett came over to plead, to plead with the Biden administration to not go into the JCPOA or whatever that thing is called with the Iranians. Please don't do it. But he's doing it. So that's why I said the documentation centers, uh, they only do so much. And I, I don't know how, you know, the Lord could have made these things clearer. But anyway, that's the program that's coming up here. And so 1938, do you all see that's just about to happen? We're almost there now. We're almost in 1938 right now. And I wrote at the bottom of the sheet, Munich Agreement, Hitler and Chamberlain. Now, in the year that all this is going to happen, right, in the year that this is going to happen, I'll just write down the date. I don't know what date it's going to be. But let's just say I wrote down this, September, October, 2000. 2023? I don't know. But in the year it happens, it will happen exactly that way. Now, the interesting thing is, is if you go back and take a look at this in a little more detail, and now we're getting into some scary stuff coming up here. The reason that this happened in 1938 is because they were worried about what was going to happen in Germany. 
they saw the Germans looking for, maybe you've heard this term, Lebensraum. They were looking for, the Germans wanted to expand, you know, the German Empire, and they were messing around with Czechoslovakia and all these places because the Germans were trying to avenge what happened during World War I. And Hitler came in as a savior to Germany, saving their economy, getting back German territory, making them a, a name in the world. So in, in many ways, this pre-craziness drama that eventually created the Chamberlain that in that period here, they were worried about Germany going back to her glory. Hitler wanted to take Germany back to the glory of the previous Reich. That's why they were the Third Reich. There was Reich 1, 2, and 3. He was going to be the Third Reich. It was going to be the best perfection of German, Germany and her influence. So he, he was interested in really watching that thing go. Now watch what's happening right now. Let's replace Germany for a minute with the new Germany. What group of people hate the Jews and are essentially the new group that's filling in? And, of course, is this group over here, right? But come back with me over here and watch what's happening right now with Iran and Afghanistan. They want to create the glory of the caliphate. They want to create the glory of an Islamic caliphate that's going to have hegemony and power over the Middle East. The problem, the only thing that's stopping the glory of the caliphate is this one little problem. Israel is right in the middle of what they'd like to do. And this is why what we're watching now is they want to restore essentially an element of the history of the glory of Islam and... They want to have this caliphate, or whatever, however you say that, and that's the goal. Now, I gave you a sheet on that tonight, I believe. Can I give you a sheet on that? Yeah, the pink sheet. You want to pull that out? How long, by the way, 20 years ago, how long did it take for 9-11 to happen? One day. How long, 20 years later, did it take for the entire military investment of this country to fall? One day. Now, I'm, we're going to get into this in the book of Daniel in a minute, but I'm just telling you these are related events. Please understand that they're related events. And, of course, as we'll see in just a minute, what's happening? Well, the Persian Empire is coming back. Because, as I've shared, and I'll share a little more, Iran and Afghanistan are the old Persian Empire. That's what we're actually watching right now. Now, remember that these great nation states that are in the Bible, we look at Persia, Babylon, and Israel, right now, as the close of the age is approaching, what's happening to all of them? They're resurrecting. They're all resurrecting and coming back to fulfill their biblical destiny. So here's this one here. This is from, uh, let's see, The Guardian, which is an English paper. The final collapse of the 20-year Western mission in Afghanistan took only a single day. I want you to stop and think about that. I mean, one of the things is just to realize the investment. You've all heard the stories. $80, $90 billion of equipment, the thousands of men, and whatever that died. I mean, it's really, it was quite an investment, right? And what was it all about? stopping another 9-11. But we're setting a new one up. See, this is things people don't see this. You can't hold anybody accountable anymore. The press just destroys anything if you raise an issue. So he says, they took uh, a single day as the Taliban gunman entered the capital in Kabul on Sunday. President Ashraf Ghani fled the country. That's the way they always seem to go. And America abandoned its embassy in panic. Even the militants themselves were surprised by the speed of the takeover. Co-founder Mullah Abdul Ghani Baradar admitted in a video statement in the evening, now the group faces the challenge of ruling, he, of ruling, he added, and notice they're expected to proclaim a new Islamic emirate of Afghanistan soon. You see, what they're doing is 
the Reich is coming back, except that it's an Islamic power, but they have one thing in common with the Germans and with the Nazis, they hate the Jews. They hate the Jewish people, and so that's what I want you to see tonight. This is a spiritual war. The Nazis were in, involved in things in the 30s with all of this, but now we see their spiritual counterpart is alive and well as the resurrection of the Persian Empire takes place. Now, I put a, a, an asterisk here, and I only gave you part of this article, and you can read it. And as you know, we sometimes just don't have time to get through all of this. In deeply humiliating scenes for the Biden administration, less than a month before, I love this, you know, here's right in the Guardian, less than a month before the 20th anniversary of the 9-11 attacks on America, smoke spiraled from the embassy compound as staff hastily destroyed documents before a final group took down the Stars and Stripes flag and headed to the airport by military helicopter. Now, what we're going to see in a minute here is some terrible things are coming to this country, and it's going to happen in an hour. Because what we're heading toward is what we would call the end of this country as we know it. But when, of course, this happens, we'll be with the Lord. But what I'm trying to do is show you this pattern. When the Lord begins doing something, he just starts doing stuff. And you'll find that this issue with Afghanistan and our country and all these things, it's all on a line. It's all a plan. It's all going on right now. And the problem is, is our people and many people have no awareness of the Bible, no interest in history, no concern at all about Israel. So who cares about any of this? Whatever's going on over in Afghanistan it had nothing to do with me. Really? I want you to turn with me to the book of Daniel, chapter 5. Now, hang on. It's a little heavy now. You want to buckle your seatbelt if you're feeling a little nervous tonight here. Huh? Daniel, chapter 5. You know, if you didn't know anything about the Bible, everybody here tonight, if you didn't know one thing about the Bible, how many of you think, just if you didn't have any information from the Lord or Scripture, that what's going on is going to end well? How many of you think it's going to end well for this country? How many of you think in the kind of behavior that we're watching going on in our own country that everything is just going to be fine and we're all going to end up having a pizza party? You see, what we're actually watching is a great empire coming to its end. doesn't mean the U.S. goes away, but our place in the history of the world is right now at a turning point in world history, and it's all about... Israel. Now, as we get into this thing with Daniel 5, it's rough. I mean, this is a rough passage, but, you know, <laughs> let's see here. We're going to go in and take a look at Daniel chapter 5. Because what is Daniel chapter 5? It's the fall, essentially, of Babylon. It's the fall of this country. Yeah. And very few people would say, well, the Bible doesn't have anything to say about the United States. Really? <laughs> We have nothing, we, we can't be in the Bible. We're just too important or big or nobody pays attention. To that. Nothing in the Bible is about our country or anything else. Well, we kind of know that's not right. We kind of sense that. Let's take a look at Daniel chapter 5, and I'm going to put out some things here and then begin to weave this together. And then I want to get into the book of Revelation. Now, we're going to go into the second seal, and we're going to see the beginning of the end of our nation. And um, it's going to start, and in that second seal, we're going to see the beginning of what we would refer to as the Third World War. The Third World War is going to come, and it's going to start in an hour. It's going to start in an hour. That's what's going to happen. Just like we're watching 9-11, we're watching the issues in Kabul. We're watching stuff happen we can't even believe. Years and years and years, it's all over in an hour. How did that happen? Because these great purposes have been put into history for the Lord to display his glory to all of us. Okay, Daniel chapter 5. Now, let me, let me show you here what the Lord is trying to tell us tonight here. And let's see, maybe I can get rid of this here. Now, just imagine if I showed up with my grease boards at the Biden administration tonight, and I just said, <laughs> I love you, and, you know, I, I think there's some mistakes going on right now. It could get very serious later. 
And here's the thing that I would say, because I don't wish anything on anybody political. I want good for everybody. I want Joe Biden, all these, I want everybody to get blessed. I want everybody to get blessed, but they're not moving in a blessing direction because they've decided to reject Israel. The issues of what they're doing right now, and they've done in, in, in Kabul and Afghanistan, I mean, those things, they're not great. But the deepest problem that has happened to our country is we're walking away from Israel. That is the issue that we should all be concerned about. It's not the, the, the craziness in, in Afghanistan. I think that's an issue. But at a deeper issue, it's the spiritual abandonment of the chosen people and treating them as though they're just another group of folks. That's exactly what Belshazzar did to Israel and why he fell. Now, if you go into originally the story of the Bible, remember, remember Daniel? Remember Daniel at the beginning of Daniel? Now, if you remember, in Daniel chapter 2, he ended up predicting the history of the world. And by the way, Daniel chapter 2, the United States is in there, right? So he's given a vision by the Lord of the history of the world to the second coming. Now, there was a, uh, the king at that time, King Nebuchadnezzar, all right, he calls Daniel and he says, now Daniel, I had this crazy vision. I don't know what it is. Can you interpret this for me? Well, you know that Daniel interpreted the vision in Daniel chapter 2. And the King Nebuchadnezzar was so overwhelmed. He said, this is amazing. Your God is God. And so what did he actually do? He honored, right, Daniel. So Nebuchadnezzar honored Daniel. And uh, let's just take a quick look at that. Just remember here. Let's go back here to um, verse 48 of chapter 2, because chapter 3 of Daniel is the Antichrist. <laughs> it's all there. Let's take a look at Daniel chapter 2, verse 48. Because Nebuchadnezzar, I mean, he had his issues, but he had some respect for the God of Israel. He understood that the God of Israel was real, and he honored Daniel about it. Now in verse 48, we said, then the king, this is Nebuchadnezzar, placed Daniel in a high position and lavished many gifts on him. He made him ruler over the entire province of Babylon and placed him in charge of all of its wise men. Moreover, at Daniel's request, the king appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego administrators over the province of Babylon while Daniel himself remained at the royal court. So Daniel is in a good place, but now here's the problem. What happens when you get a change of leadership? Which is exactly where we are right now. You have a change in administration. Kings and leaders change a nation. Would you all agree dramatically? So let's go back to Daniel chapter 5. And let's pick the verse up here in verse 18. Daniel chapter 5 verse 18. O king, the most high God gave your father, Nebuchadnezzar, sovereignty and greatness and glory and splendor because of the high position he gave him. All the peoples and nations, the men of every language, dreaded and feared him. Those the king wanted to put to death, he put to death. Those he wanted to spare, he spared. Those that he wanted to promote, he promoted. Those he wanted to humble, he humbled. But when his heart became arrogant and hardened with pride... He was, he was deposed from his royal throne and stripped of his glory. He was driven away from men, I'm sorry, from people and given the mind of an animal. Uh, he lived with the wild donkeys and ate grass like cattle. You know one thing about the Bible? Do you ever forget this stuff, you know? He's taken a great leader, humbled him, he's out there eating grass like an animal. It's amazing how the Lord speaks and we never forget these stories, right? And what he says, and his body was drenched with the dew of heaven. And until, notice that very important until, he acknowledged that the most high God is sovereign over the kingdoms of men and sets them over anyone he wishes. But notice the but, verse 22. But you, his son, O Belshazzar, have not humbled yourself. Though you knew all of this, right? You knew the history of what happened but you went your own way and you attacked Israel. Now watch this, just stay with me here. 
Instead, you set yourself up against the Lord of heaven. And you know how you always set yourself up against the Lord of heaven? First of all, it can happen in the heart. But in this period and during this time is when you go after the Jews. Because the moment you begin to attack the Jewish people, you are attacking their God. And the moment you put yourself into that position, you are beginning to spurn the God of heaven and you're inviting his potential judgments. That is exactly what happened in January. That's why I have told you in class we're at a turning point in world history because we're not going to be going back to be a supporter of Israel and the rapture is coming near now. So we see that now and that kind of breaks my heart because I love Israel and it hurts me to even talk this way but that's kind of where we're heading here. Verse 23, he said, you had, notice what he says here, you had the goblets from his holy temple brought to you. In other words, he didn't care about the temple. He didn't care about Israel. He just treated things that were holy commonly. Hmm. 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 Your wives and your concubines drank wine from them. You praised the gods of silver and gold, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which cannot see or hear or understand, but you did not honor the God who holds in his hand your life and all your ways. Therefore he sent the hand that wrote the inscription, and this is the inscription that was written, and now we're getting the interpretation. It came earlier here. Meany, meany, tekel, parson. This is what these words mean. Meany, God has numbered the days of your reign and brought it to an end. Tekel, you have been weighed on the scales and found whining. Perez, your kingdom is divided and giving to the Medes and the Persians. There they are. Now watch what's happening. Okay, so who's been calling the shots and having this big empire? Babylon, right? Babylon has running, been running the show, right? But what's happened? Israel gets trashed and the king is drunk. He's unaware that another power is about to destroy him. The Biden administration has absolutely no idea what's coming. They're off with some political soundbite, and they don't realize the terror that is going to come to this country because of this leadership. Now, as of course we follow, that's why I said you need to buckle your seatbelt here. You got it buckled here? Then, at Belshazzar's command, Daniel, I'm sorry, yeah, then at Belshazzar's command, Daniel was clothed in purple, a gold chain, was placed around his neck, and he was proclaimed the third highest ruler. So now he's coming back a little bit, but that very night, Belshazzar, the king of the Babylonians, was slain, and Darius the Mede took over the kingdom at the age of 62. All right. What has happened to this country? The writing is on the wall. Not any question about that in my mind. Boy, I love this country. Now, let's take a look at where we are here. Let me erase this. Israel is connected to seven kingdoms in world history. So it's all about Israel. It's always been about Israel. And let's see if we can find this. And it's electrifying to see this, but it's also troubling, you know. Okay, the first kingdom that Israel ever deals with is Egypt, right? Remember Moses? Right? And then after Egypt, then we have the Assyrians, the Babylonians, and what we call the Medo-Persian Empire, or the Medes and Persians. I'll just put the Persian Empire. Persian Empire, Afghanistan, and Iran. So we have the Persian Empire. And then there's the Greeks. And then there's the Romans. And then we've got basically one, two, three, four, five, six. And then there's the revived Roman Empire. And the last kingdom, of course, the Antichrist. So we have Antichrist. In terms of where we are in and out, we are right here now. The Babylonian kingdom is about to fall. And as this kingdom comes in, we're going to see the Third World War. And basically, as they're coming in and dealing with the Babylonians, what's happened to Babylon? 
Babylon is drunk. Babylon is not treating Israel well. Babylon is totally unaware of what's coming. How many people in this country are aware that we're in a, in a very serious, serious crisis? You know what everybody's thinking about tonight? Getting your, your shot. How many people are concerned about the whole place of our nation in history? People aren't even thinking like this. It's not an issue. We're just going on our next vacation. You see, the point is, what God is telling us is that we have been found weighed in the balance. Now, you notice this group of Persians, right? You know, you know, it's kind of like, you know, we're sitting out here playing volleyball and having fun and eating ice cream and everything like that. Have you ever seen some uh, video uh, uh, of this crowd? You ever seen how serious they are? And what are they serious to do? To restore the caliphate and destroy Israel. We're over here playing volleyball, and they're getting ready for a war. And we all think that everything's fine because we got out of Afghanistan. We're out of there now. Everything's going to be fine, and we're just going to sit back here because, well, they couldn't do anything to us. And what is the problem of the country today is people do not remember 9-11. Because if they can do what they did in 2001, does anybody think that that can't happen in an hour? Let's turn with me to Revelation chapter 18. And now we're going to get into some Revelation stuff. Not exactly lighthearted, you know. So, I'm glad that when this happens, we'll be with the Lord. But, but, it, but I think it's important to remember that we can see the early stages of it now. And what is the reason that the Lord even gives us this stuff in the Scriptures? First of all, He wants us to be serious that He's the Lord. But I think the other purpose is He wants to warn and wake us up so we can help other people. Yep. That is what this is about right now. Anything that you're hearing tonight that makes you realize, wow, I think it's getting serious here, those are things God is showing us to help somebody else so they can be warned. How many people in Washington today are warning anybody of the peril this nation is in? Not many. There's a few, but it's a pretty small group. All right, here we are now in Revelation chapter 18. And, in the, and let's see, how am I doing on time? I'm going to put us in there, and I'll show you the whole thing here in a few minutes if we've got time. We have a little time here. Okay. After this, Revelation 18, verse 1, I saw another angel coming down from heaven. He had great authority, and earth was illuminated by his splendor. With a mighty voice, he shouted, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a home of demons a haunt for every evil spirit, a haunt for every unclean and detestable bird. For all the nations have drunk the maddening wine of her adulteries. By the way, do you know one of the things that really tripped the Taliban off against this country? Is the LGBTQ issue. And imagine going to a Muslim country and trying to get transgenderism in there. They look at our country what is the matter with these people? They look at our country not as a Judeo-Christian country with values. They look at our country as a threat against them and their children bringing in these weird ideas. Uh, boys aren't boys and girls aren't girls. Try bringing that message to the Taliban tonight. Can you imagine sitting around with the Taliban leaders and say, hey, we've got a new agenda here. That's going nowhere. And that's the problem, because we're trying to bring a woke understanding of the world to a group of people they even know better. Even though they're pagans, they know that's not right. You know, they don't have Revel G Genesis chapter 1, God created the male and female. The Taliban know that's silly. It's wrong. And that was one of the reasons why they felt America was so decadent. Another reason why they did what they did. And now we're sitting around going, what happened over there? What happened? Why don't they love us? Something happened there. I don't know what happened there. The kings of the earth committed adultery with her. And notice, does this sound like any nation you? The merchants of the earth grew rich from her excessive luxuries. Since World War II, one of the fascinating things, we're not going to do it all tonight, but basically... Imports in the United States since World War II 
have absolutely exploded. We are the true importing nation. And we're buying everybody's stuff. And now, by the way, just in case you didn't know, we're broke. And yet, we keep borrowing, we keep buying, because why? Well, it'll never, nothing will ever happen. If you spend 10 or 15 trillion a week or something, it, 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 yeah, whatever. It's all good. You see, what's happened is, like Belshazzar, he didn't understand that all of this was going on around. The Medes and the Persians wanted to take the Babylonian kingdom down. They were strategizing, planning, and figuring out how can we get those Babylonians. Meanwhile, the king says, hey, we're at the top of the world. Life's good. Big party. We're having a wonderful time. And all of a sudden, he didn't realize, well, tonight you're going to be dead. See, this is the problem. This is, it can happen to anybody. It happened to me. It can happen to anybody. We just lose touch with reality. What I would say for many people in our country today in leadership, they're not in touch with reality. They're not in touch with the fact you can't spend $100 trillion and think that money's going to be there. You can't do the things that have been done to Israel and the other nations and think this will go on forever. But who's telling anybody that? Not many. How many of you heard a good message on that on Sunday morning in the church? Because remember the word that scares people to death in a church? Are you ready for this word? Get ready. Hold on. Repent. What did Jesus' his first word in his, the beginning of his gospel ministry? Repent. The kingdom of God is at hand. This is an ugly word to Americans today. We don't, we don't realize, you know, we got trouble with the Persian Empire coming, but no, let's forget about that. Let's just forget about all of it. Enjoy yourself. Be blessed. Well, it's in the days of Noah. You see how this has gotten a hold of us? And we're all guilty. I'm guilty. We're all a part of this drama that's unfolding. And so now all the nations have become rich on this element of Babylon. Verse 4, Then I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, so that you will not share in her sins, so that you will not receive any of her plagues, for her sins are piled up to heaven, and God has remembered her crimes. Give back to her as she is given back. Pay her double for what she has done. Mix her a double portion from her own cup. Give her as much torture and grief as the glory and luxury she gave herself. In her heart she boasts, I sit as queen, I am not a widow, and I will never mourn. Therefore, in one day, her plagues will overtake her. Notice that interesting period. Notice this, saints. Look up here. Daniel 5. Today in Afghanistan. 9, 11. One hour. One day. It happened fast. And, of course, the story is nobody saw it coming. They were drunk. They were living in another world that was out of touch with the Lord. Therefore, in verse 8, I will... One day her plagues will overtake her, death and mourning and famine. She will be consumed by fire. For mighty is the Lord God who judges her. When the kings of the earth who committed adultery with her and share her luxury see the smoke of her burning, they will weep and mourn over her. Terrified at her torment, they will stand far off and cry, Woe, woe, O great city, O Babylon, city of power, in one hour your doom has come. The merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over her because no one buys their cargoes anymore. Cargoes of per gold and silver and precious stones of pearls, fine linen, purple silk and scarlet cloth, every sort of citron wood and on and on it goes. So we could read and continue on here, but the bottom line is what we actually have in the book of Revelation here is a judgment on Babylon. But let me, let me show you something now, because Babylon is not just the United States. So here's we are. This is where we are right now. Babylon is about to fall. And let's see, where are we here? Um, I wanted to give you another sheet here. Yeah, take out the yellow sheet, if you could pull that one out there. 
Now, you probably know that this is a very big subject about Babylon, right? It's very hard for us to see ourselves in any of this. Because the book of Revelation has, as we'll get to this eventually, there are two very important chapters that we're going to look at eventually, Revelation 17 and 18. Basically, what it's dealing with is the European Union and the U.S. of A. One is going to eventually be under the Antichrist, the political capital of the world, because the Antichrist will be out of the EU. He's not out of the United States. Does everybody understand that the Antichrist has nothing to do with this country? That's going to move back over into the European Union, as the Bible said it would. Why are we not going to be in charge of this? Because actually, if you remember from just your geography, you know, what nation is real close to Israel? Well, the Roman Empire, right? That's where it is back in Rome. So you have the political and religious elements of Babylon, but you also have the economic. If someone was to ask you, what's the difference between Europe and the United States? If someone was to ask you that. Well, one of the main things has always been free markets. It's always been the idea that we had a tremendous economy, that the world always looked to the United States as the nation that understood how to build the free market system. Many of the European economies are much more controlled, uh, and many of them socialistic. And isn't it interesting what's happening right now? Europe has been socialistic for quite a while, right? We're joining Europe now. We're becoming socialist. We're moving back because what's the Lord doing? He's bringing the United States back in touch with the European Union. Why? Because this is the last kingdom. This is the last kingdom of those nations according to Daniel chapter 2. Now, on this yellow sheet, let's see if we can, can get this here. Um, yeah, I guess we can do this. This is where the Lord <coughs> is fascinating in terms of geography. Now, you notice I gave you a picture of essentially the year that King Belshazzar died. I would have no hesitation saying this. Belshazzar. I don't have any problem saying that. Now, whether it's just him or the administration or future people, but I'm just saying it's, it's a group of people that have lived in this amazing nation, had so many blessings, and are unaware God exists. That was Belshazzar. He was proud. He thought he was so smart. He forgot about his dad. He forgot about Nebuchadnezzar. He forgot what happened to his own father. He forgot the heritage, and he let all of those lessons go, and everything began to fall apart. So look up here in the sheet. And so this is the actual year. It's around 540. I just put this together for you. 540 B.C. is about the year that Belshazzar died. Now look at the kingdom there. Do you see the Persian Empire there? It's kind of a lighter color. And I wrote in there, what? Iran and Afghanistan. Those are the identical empires of the Persian Empire. Not close. It's identical. And they're in the exact geographical location as they were in the 6th century B.C. Now, you notice that where is Babylon in relationship to Persia? It's to the west. U.S.A., European Union, just happens to be to the west of Persia. Isn't it amazing how the Lord does these things? So here you take a map or something out here from the 6th century B.C., and the message here in this story was that the Persian Empire was growing and growing and growing. And finally, what happened? It took over the last kingdom and then began to be a world power. And so what I wrote here is Babylon falls and Persia rises, right? So these are the great changes that are underway right now. It's going on right now. Now, again, maybe this just blows the top of your head off. You may not agree with it, but I want you to see it's all about what's going about to happen in Israel. Because with Babylon out of the way, right, the Antichrist can come in. In other words, when this kingdom here, this U.S. of A., who nobody would have thought, how many of you would have thought 10 years ago this would even be talking about this? All of a sudden, literally overnight, we're gone. Why? The Bible prophecies have to be fulfilled. 
you know, this is one of the questions so many people have asked over the years, where is the United States? What's happened to our country? Well, here's what's happened. We've fallen. We've fallen. And I, I, I won't get into it tonight, but I got to tell you, saints, we got some really serious issues coming economically. Does everybody see that? Does everybody see that? And that's how it's going to eventually move to where we go. Okay, let me see where I am here in terms of, let's see, I did that, I did that. All right, turn with me, if you will, please, to the book of Revelation, chapter 6. And I, th I may finish up with this tonight. I probably will. I think we've got enough, and your head's probably buzzing anyway. Revelation, chapter 6. And we'll finish up with this tonight. And... Uh, Yeah, the Persian Empire is on the move. We'll take a look at two scriptures and wrap this up tonight. Revelation chapter 6, and we've looked at this before the break. How does Revelation chapter 6 start? It starts with the Antichrist. So we know that everything starts there in Revelation chapter 6. And by the way, the good news is, right, remember everybody, for those of you that have been here, we're with the Lord in Revelation 4 and 5. So just remember, this is happy land over here. But now Antichrist has taken over because, of course, the world doesn't want our Lord. So now the Lord, as we looked at it, John 5, you don't want me? Well, then you're going to take somebody else. And that's the prophecy that we looked at earlier in the evening. John 5. I watched the Lamb, this is our Lord, in heaven, open the first of the seven seals. Then I heard one of the four living creatures say in a voice like thunder, come, and I looked, and there before me was a white horse. Its rider held the bow, and he was given a crown, and he rode out as a conqueror bent on conquest. And we've talked before, this is the Antichrist taking the world stage. He's conquering the world with peace. He's going to get the Nobel Peace Prize. I don't know, I won't be here, but he's going to get some sort of an award. He's conquering the world with peace, but unfortunately it's a false peace, as it was with Hitler. And how long, by the way, do you remember in, in Germany? Remember 1938? Remember we had peace with Hitler in 1938? Do you remember when the Second World War began? Well, he, he started the peace thing with Chamberlain in September, right at the end of the month. September 1939, World War II started. Right, the attack on Poland. That was the beginning of the Second World War. So we had a year there, and now we have a series of peace here. And by the way, I can tell you exactly how long this is going to go. Uh, the peace with the Antichrist is going to last three years. And then, and we'll get into this, we're going to see the beginning of World War III, and it will come starting with an attack on this country. And nobody will think it's coming. Sound familiar? You know, I remember when 9-11 happened, um, somebody in church called me and they said, hey, Jeff, I was in my, sitting in my, uh, in my den and someone from Oak Hill called me and said, hey, there's something weird going on in New York. Turn on the TV. Well, you all know the rest of the story. That's the way this is going to happen, church. Something similar to that is going to happen against this country. You know, and it's interesting, too. We've been talking about nuclear weapons and everybody's worried and concerned, but they'll never have an effect on anybody. Iran is doing crazy things, but that'll never come our way. The Persian Empire wants nuclear weapons, but oh, that won't have anything to do with us. My point is, how can we be so silly? How can we be so silly to think this doesn't have some trajectory? That all of this stuff is never going to be ever used? I don't know, it's just where it seemed to be people that are living in some dream world. When the Lamb opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, Come. Then another horse came out, a fiery red one. Its rider was given power to take peace from the earth and to make men slay each other, and to him was given a large sword. Now we're in that. So our country's right in there, and that's the beginning of what we would call World War III. Now, here in 1938, we had a year. Here, we're going to have three. We had one year of peace with Hitler, and a year later, in 1939, the Second World War began. I want you to see that these patterns are underway right now, so we're going to get three years. 
And everybody thinks, you know, when this happens, when the Antichrist takes over, hey, things are looking great. Things are really looking great. Peace, it's, everybody seems to be getting along. We're rebuilding the third temple, and life is good in Israel, and everything seems to be great. But then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, boom, the war starts. And it starts with us. And we have no idea that it was coming. Let's turn and finish off one scripture. Go with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and that'll be enough lightheartedness for tonight. Now, here's what I want to say. Whatever's coming, if everything I've said is crazy, here's what I want you to think about. Something has got to happen. If our Lord is going to come back to save a world in war, when does that war start? What does the Lord Jesus say in Matthew 24? That unless I come back, there wouldn't be anybody left alive. What the heck is that about? I thought we're all heading for peace. So I want you to begin to see these are serious, serious, serious times. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Isn't this interesting that this is written almost 2,000 years ago, and I don't think anybody believes it. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 1. Now, brothers and sisters, about the times and dates, we do not want to need to write to you, for we know very well that the day of the Lord, now notice the day of the Lord is after the rapture, will come like a thief in night. Well, people are saying peace and safety. In other words, notice peace and safe. They're going to keep everybody safe. They're not going to get them saved. They're going to have safety. When people are saying peace and safety, what? This doesn't sound right. Destruction will come on them suddenly as pains on pregnant women. And notice what Paul says. They're not going to escape. So what do we have here? Well, we know what happens here is we've got the Antichrist. This is a red horse. And, of course, this is the white horse. Let me leave you with these verses that Paul leaves the church with in Thessalonica, and then we're done here. What does Paul say about the church? This is what he says to me and to all of you. We should know some of this is underway. You know, we don't have it all sorted out, and I don't either. But we should know we're heading for trouble. Anybody who's watching a press conference with the leader of the free world, and he's kind of wandering around and... I don't know, where am I? You know, I mean, and I'm not trying to mock him. I really am not. This is ridiculous. And we're putting up with it as a nation. How do we think that's going to end well? And I pray for him. I wish good for him and his wife and family. That just can't go on when you've got the Taliban on the loose. And they're hanging out with people who are building nuclear weapons to destroy Israel. And we're supposed to say nothing about it and think, oh, well, it's good we're out of there. Let's just get along now. We'll just come home and have a great Thanksgiving. Don't worry about those people. Okay, what does Paul say? He says, but you are not in darkness, so that that day should surprise you. What's going to happen to America right now? It's going to be a surprise, right? It's going to be a surprise. But that day should not surprise you. You are all sons of the light and sons of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness, so then let us not be like others who are sleeping. You know, the snoring in Washington right now, it just about puts you out. Wouldn't I? I think I'd have to have earmuffs to be in Washington, the snoring in that capital right now. And I pray for good people. I mean, God, Lord, help us, help us, Lord, we need you here. He says, we do not belong to the night or the darkness, so let us then not be like others who are asleep, but let us be alert and self-controlled. For those who are asleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be self-controlled, put on faith and love as a breastplate, and the hope of salvation as a helmet. And notice what our Lord says. This ought to be one of the great verses for you tonight. This is why our Lord came. God did not appoint us for any of this. He did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us so that whether we're awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Therefore, what? Encourage one another and build each other up just, in fact, as you're doing. You know, I wonder sometimes if this builds people up. Because it's a little heavy duty. But if we know God's working and he's got a plan, it should encourage us. I don't get it all. I don't understand it all. But I know this plan is underway. And I know he loves us. And his plan cannot be stopped. Amen? Amen. Good night, church. Have a beautiful evening. <laughs>